Okay, Emily, Morris. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's great to be back here. I, I was here a couple of years ago um, and gave a, a presentation. Um, and I think it's one of the most interesting discussions that it's possible to have when you're giving a presentation on people to talk to you because you actually know a lot more about it than most of the audiences I speak to. So I hope we'll have a very interesting discussion. Um, Steve and I have had a, uh, made sure that we've got a division of labour, quite a sharp division of labour between us. So I'm going to just concentrate on the thing that I do most, which is pouring over the numbers on the Cuban economy. And this is, the intention is to provide context for the discussion about the changes that are being made at the moment. So I don't apologise for the fact that my slides are all charts uh, of numbers, and I'm just going to try and take you through them. And so afterwards, please do, you know, if there's any questions, you know, the charts, you know, are worth a million words or whatever, you know, so that there's an awful lot hidden in them. So please do ask questions. So I'll just take you through, and I'll try to explain it's one slide thing. now. Oh, is it not working? No. So, oh, no, it's working, but Okay, oh, let's have a look. That sounds like it's... Projecting a bit more? Is that better? Yeah? Okay, well just put your hand up if you can't hear me. Just try and um, shout a bit more. Okay, right, so the first chart I'm going to, to present is the, the obvious one where we all, I see economists always start, is with the GDP. So what I did yesterday, I just went into the World Bank, um, World Data um, Database, and I pulled out the Cuba GDP figure, and I'd just like to compare it with where Cuba stands in relation to um, other countries. So um, the, the GDP we're looking at, the national income, is purchasing power parity. It's quite a complicated calculation that the, the World Bank do, but these are World Bank figures anyway. Um, and so you have the Cuba picture, which we're very familiar with since 1990, which is the period we're, we're looking at. Um, you have a contraction in the early years, and then since then you've had a recovery. Um, we generally say that around 2005 is when Cuban GDP per head, real GDP per head, really recovered to its previous level. Uh, but this is an index figure, and we start in uh, on 100 in the year 1990. Okay. So now the point of doing this index is to compare it with the performance of other um, countries. So if we compare it there, we can see this is the world's GDP figure. So you can see that Cuba definitely had its lost decade and a half in terms of the shock and the recovery post um, the collapse of the Soviet bloc. And then there's been recovery and sort of trying to catch up ever since. So Cuba's still below where it would be if it hadn't experienced that severe shock. Um, the next um, aggregate, the average here is the Latin America picture. And you can see the Latin America is pretty much in line with the global pattern. And so Cuba has also fallen behind its um, fellow countries in, in Latin America. But you can see the catch up is actually a bit closer. Um, and then I just thought I'd put the United Kingdom in there and we see what, what happened there. And we think, of course, it's amazing. <laughs> it's that even though Cuba had this terrible collapse, in terms of its relation, GDP relation with the year 1990, we're actually at the same place as the UK is. And then we've got the US as well, um, showing a similar picture. So when people say Cuban economy hasn't done very well, it's a disaster, it's bankrupt, and all the rest of it, actually the performance in terms of trying to catch up has been remarkable given the circumstances that everybody here knows very well, in that Cuba had no access to external finance, and it's been, um, the US has been doing its standards to, to try to um, prevent it from happening. So those are some general um, and then, what we also know about Cuba is that there's been a massive structural transformation. I heard one economist talking about the Cuban bounce back from the from the collapse, or the the, uh, the recession of the early 90s. It's not a bounce back; it's a complete restructuring of the economy. And the way that we can see this very clearly is if we look at the external sector and we look at how Cuba's been paying its way in the world. And so this this slide is quite an interesting one, just to show the kind of proportions between different aspects of Cuba's recovery, finding a new place for itself in the global economy. Um, so what I do is I take, go to the, the external accounts, and we're looking at the total dollar income from the various different sources. And the total of them all together makes up Cuba's import capacity. That is the capacity to import goods that it needs to supply and to, to put its inputs to its own production. 
Okay, so we start with the sugar, uh, sugar products. You can see what happened there. Not only did the price collapse, but output collapsed, and so we've got no power strike at all in sugar, really. Um, we do have a process now where they're trying to recover the sugar sector. It's been disappointing this year um, because of the weather, actually. Um, so that's sugar, and then you have minerals. And you see the first, one of the first important substitutes for sugar was the nickel development, which of course was done with cherry. Um, and around 2005, 6, 7, there was a surge in nickel prices, which is what, why that figure has become more relevant. And then you've got a little contribution from tobacco products, pretty steady, um, not huge. And then you've got medicines, and medicines are, are more important than tobacco now. Um, and this is just goods. Actually, the pharmaceutical industry also um, exports some licenses. It gets earnings from licensing medicines and other people patents, so there's more actually coming from that sector than is reflected here. Um, and then the one after that is um, oil products. We've got the surge at the end there. That's the Cienfuegos oil refinery um, done with Venezuela. So now Cuba imports and exports oil products. Um, and then we have other goods. And what's really noticeable about that is that other goods is actually not very large. So that's all other goods apart from those selected ones, which is kind of shows how little diversification there has been in um, physical production. Then we move to services, and we have tourism becoming very important in the 1990s. <coughs> and then we have other services, and we have this dramatic development um, post-2004 with the arrangement with Venezuela. This is the medical services. Um, and then we have remittances, not nearly as huge as the, the discussion in the US would suggest. You know, um, when Bush was in power, they tried to completely stop remittances from coming through, and the, the kind of discourse in the US was always about um, how this was going to bring down the Cuban government because Cuban economy was entirely dependent on remittances. And now you can see it's, it's significant, but it's not um, the thing that's holding the whole thing together. Um, and then finally, this, this one is net financing. And this is a, an odd one because this kind of puts everything together. That's net flows of external capital um, and the use of reserves. And how that works is all the. Yeah, so if you've got a positive there, you're either borrowing money or you're using up reserves. Yeah? If you've got a negative, you're either repaying money or you're accumulating reserves. So it's, it's the two things added together. And what is very interesting is, first of all, in the 1990s, of course, Cuba um, completely lost access to the financing from the Soviet bloc, used up the reserves, and when both of those sources had gone, there was very little coming in. And then, just recently, there's been a huge attempt to rebuild the level of reserves in order to make the economy less susceptible to shocks. We've got the one year, 2008, when the nickel price fell and they had three um, hurricanes all in the same year, and then they had to use up some of their reserves in order to um, buy food. So that, that gives you a, a picture of the way the economy is going. Okay. I, I don't want to go with that. I'm trying a bit faster now. Oh, this one is, sorry, really on the nickel. This is trade partner dependency. So what I've got here, if you look at the axis, it goes up to 100. This is a share of the total, okay, which is accounted for by each trade partner. Or a separate group of them. And what I've done here is um, first of all, you can see with Russia, the, the, the trade with Russia diminishing to, to very little amount. This obviously discussion is going on now, and this is going to change. Um, and then there's the other, that's other Eastern Europe countries, and combined in 1990, they made maybe 70% of total trade. Um, and this is total trade in goods and services, okay? So the level of dependency at that time was huge. And um, they've lost, Cuba's lost the trade with those countries. Now, if we just build up all of the others, we've got Canada um, becoming more important, and that's um, clearly a lot of that is the nickel. Um, then you've got Holland, so that surge there is when the nickel started going through Holland. Um, Spain has always been there, China increasing recently, and also taking the nickel instead of Holland recently. Um, and then you've got other goods. Um, the, well, all other countries where the goods go to. Um, and you can see that actually um, they're a smaller and smaller, well, they're, they're smaller now as a percentage of the total than they were in the 1990s. We've had a bit of a concentration recently 
There you have the tourism, which of course is quite diversified as a whole, because there are many countries that tourism have them. Canada is very important, but it's quite a diversified um, bunch of countries that the income comes from. And then you have Venezuelan goods, and then you have services. Um, the other services, not tourism. Now, not all of those are medical um, doctors to Venezuela. We know that medical doctors go to other places as well. And we also know that there are other services among those, including licensing of Cuban patients and medicines. We don't have any breakdown. But what you get very clearly from that sign that it's supposed to, it's supposed to show is there was dependency on the Soviet bloc in 1990. And there's now quite a worrying degree of dependency on Venezuela. Um, it's not as big. If you take the 70% there and you add all of the um, non-tourism services plus the Venezuela trade on the other side, it still doesn't come to 70%. So there is more diversification than there needs to be. But there has been, um, you know, there's a vulnerability there, which is one of the reasons for um, the drive to change things. Um, at the moment. All right, now if we move to the import, um, so the percentage of imports accounted for by each category of good. So we're looking at fuel, food, machinery, equipment, chemicals, raw materials, and other. I'm just going through that very quickly. This is actually quite easy to follow compared to the previous one. Um, you've got fuel started, you know, nearly 30% in 1990, staying pretty similar throughout. Right at the end, then, you've got the increase in fuel imports, which is associated with the processing that we saw earlier. So that's not strictly as, you know, the dependency has risen, because if that fuel disappeared, then they would, they would balance itself out. But nonetheless, fuel dependency is still very high. 30% of, of export earnings have to be spent on importing fuel, which is why Cuba is very, very anxious to move towards renewables and to um, find other ways um, including energy efficiency, to improve the situation. And then you have food. And if you put them both together, they come to 60% of all import spending, which is a high degree of dependency on some essential items. But then you get the others, you get machinery and equipment, varying um, a lot over the years, chemicals, raw materials, and other. And if you look at the, the other, it's very small. There's not a lot of diversification there as well. You have strong control, kind of rationing the foreign exchange in order to buy the most essential things, still in Cuba. Okay, the next slide is the investment rate, and um, this is quite straightforward. We've got the real GDP trend over the period, falling and rising, and then you've got the imports falling and rising and, and recovering, and then you've got real investment, and the picture is it collapsed and it has not recovered. Um, as, uh, since the Soviet collapse. What is really remarkable as well, if you put these two things together, the Cuban economy has kept up in terms of GDP with, you know, it's catching up the world. Even with a level of aggregate investment that's that low, it's quite amazing. The investment efficiency has been very, very high. That's the amount of GDP growth you get per, per dollar spent on investment. Um, but it's a, it's a chronic problem, and the level of GDP, the level of investment as a percentage of GDP is still only about 10%. In China, it's about 50%, and the rest of Latin America is about 20%. So it's severely um, below what it should be in Cuba. And so something needs to be done. A new model of accumulation, that is, the Cuban economy needs to work out how to generate funds, um, some kind of a surplus for investment and then how to channel and kind of what mechanisms is going to be used to use that investment, to, uh, to use that surplus to invest in increasing capacity. And that's what the living in is about, I think, very, you know, at their heart in terms of um, the economics. They're trying to find a new model of accumulation. So far, it's been very much through the state, and that's actually been appropriate for recovery. But now, they've reached a stage where this, the next stage is diversification and a new model of accumulation needs to be developed. Okay, um, the next slide is, this is the one I showed before, and this is about um, relative incomes. Okay, so if you look at the red line, this is the value of $100, which is the sort of amount of money that people get in the businesses, $100 per month, as a multiple of the average 
monthly wage of the people working in the state sector. And you can see um, in the crisis years it flew right up. And then people were wondering why people were working in the black markets. Clearly, the incentive to do so was enormous. But even though it's reduced now, it's still five times the income of somebody who's been working all month. Just $100, five times the income of it. And so you can see that, that, that gap. This is when it's converted in the Kadeka, uh, the unofficial exchange rate, which is what people face. I wouldn't say that the unofficial exchange rate is an accurate description of the actual value of Cuban wage. The Cuban wage is worth more than $20, without a doubt, in terms of what it would buy. But you can actually acquire that amount of purchasing power if you have just one, you know, just $20 coming in, or if you're earning $20 in the informal economy. And that creates this, this what they call the inverted pyramid and all the rest of it. Huge distortion to people's everyday decisions. And, um, it's also a huge distortion to the way that economic decisions are made. Working out what's efficient and what's not efficient when you've got these different exchange rates and different sets of prices is very difficult. Um, and the, the blue one is the, the exchange rate. So that's a collapse of the exchange rate in the early 1990s. There's been a recovery, but it's nowhere near <coughs> what it was before. So one of the biggest, um, how much is the time? One of the biggest um, changes which we're going to see probably in the next year is the exchange rate change in Cuba. And that's going to have a huge significant, I think maybe we'll, we'll talk about that further, because I think that's really the one to watch at the moment. Um, coming to the next one, this is uh, just talking about the government spending. Um, what the, this slide is supposed to show is um, how the government priorities have been since the crash, but also what's happened to public investment. So you have welfare spending never fell in nominal terms, even in the worst case of the crisis. It then rose very dramatically, and now it's stabilized in nominal terms. So there is this kind of shows the, the efforts that have been made since 2009 to try to reduce the burden of the welfare budget. That's health, education, and other welfare social assistance and so on. What did you do? Uh, they're Cuban pesos. Okay, so this is a nominal term. Um, sorry, and that's investment spending, and you can see that the, the decline in investment spending in nominal terms, and even though it's picked up a little bit in 2012, it's still woefully low. Um, and so if you think that welfare spending may be sort of constant in real terms, or something like that, then investment spending in real terms is poor. Um, and the next to show welfare spending as a percentage of GDP, and you can see that it's, um, it's on the right hand side. So it was 20% of GDP, and it's actually now 30% of GDP. So all throughout the hard years, you know, on average, over the, the hard years, the welfare spending as a percentage of GDP has risen. Um, and there you have investment spending as a percentage of GDP, and you can see how much that's fallen. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of the how the government is trying to, to manage its budget, it's got to increase the amount of welfare spending. Actually, the, the main target isn't uh, the increasing amount of investment spending. The main target for that isn't by cutting welfare spending, but by cutting the subsidies that now um, they have spent in the productive sector. Okay, so, um, so what are they trying to do? Well, I, my next slide, I'm gonna, I think I'm leading on to, to Steve now. Um, is one of the big things that's happened in the last year, enormous project, is the Marielle project, with Brazilian money and Venezuelan money. Um, and it's, so there has been a, an increase in investment, and it's gone at the moment to, to, to mega projects. There's Marielle, there's the Cienfuegos, the Marielle free trade zone around it, um, and there's been the uh, foreign direct investment law, um, there's been a restructuring of debt, which is very interesting. It's in order to try to get Cuba to have more access to external financing. Um, and the very important ones recently are the restructuring of debt with Mexico and with um, Russia. And there's also been the start of an increase in wages going on. In the next year, I think the 
as I said, the most important thing is going to be the exchange rate change. I think it's going to happen probably within 12 months. Nobody has told me, um, but it's just from what's happened. I, you might have seen in, I think it's October last year, the government announced that it had a timetable, but didn't say what the timetable was, which is quite normal for making exchange rate changes because otherwise people speculate on it. Um, um, and then in February, they issued instructions on how to do it, which made it very clear that what was going to happen is the CUC, the convertible peso, is going to be withdrawn from circulation. And the big question is, as well as the timing, is what's the exchange rate going to be for the CUC um, against the dollar now? Will it be 24 to 1? Or will there be changes there? Um, and so we'll, we'll have to see, and how's that going to work in terms of? Um, adjusting all of the prices. So there's a moment of huge uncertainty. If you think about, you know, when inflation here goes up 5%, we're all in a, you know, it's a big thing. But there, they're going to have prices moving um, by much, much larger percentages. Wages of the health workers went up by 100% the nominal wages. You know, you're going to see price and wage adjustments of that order. So it's going to be a very difficult moment in the next year, I think. Um, here is, as you can see, you've got this picture as well, it's the, uh, the equipment coming in from Ariel. That boat has got four cranes on it that have been shipped all the way from China because they can't get them from the US, which is just a few miles away. Um, and the, those are going to be the beginning, that's the core of the, the, uh, the what they call the deep port. And the deep port will take the new ships which are coming through the Panama Canal when that opens and got these more mega ships. Um, which could come through. And what's interesting is to see, you know, think where those ships are going to go. They're working with Brazilians, obviously, but they could go from China to Brazil. Um, but clearly, and the, you know, it's not been not noticed in the US, Maria is the closest Cuban port to the United States. And so Cuba is actually positioning itself for potentially for opening up a trade with the US, um, which raises a lot of questions. Okay, so here we are. Um, the change is coming. <laughs> the buses will come. When you do get on, it's going to be a bit uncomfortable. Um, but it'll get there in the end. Okay, but I think um, so. There's a huge uncertainty ahead. I think, in a way, this year economically hasn't been all that. There hasn't been much good news. Sugar harvest hasn't been very good. Tourism is picking up a little bit. Nickel's down. Oil's um, not so good. So, in a way, you know, they've had. Slow economic growth for quite a long time. A lot of changes. We've still got the inverted pyramid. So you've, you've still got, um, you know, a cheap hardship. I mean, it's really difficult for a lot of Cubans, and they really do need something um, positive to happen soon. Um, and I think potentially the exchange rate change could be that thing, but we'll have to see which way it goes. Okay, thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I will find myself turning around, I think, a bit because it's easier to read on there than it's on my multiple page thing. And I'm just going to start really with a reminder, uh, the have been of reminders of the detail today, the context in which all of this discussion takes place. That is, anybody know where it is? Anyone been there? Right, was that, you know what it is or you've been there? In the bay. Oh, okay, okay. That is the US military base in Guantanamo with a picture taken from a new cafeteria that the Cubans have built on top of a hill <laughs> at a fairly safe distance on the main road, which some of you may know from uh, Santiago to Barracoa. Uh, there's a, a proper viewing tower, and uh, the Cubans are very nervous on it. They go up, they're not sure whether they're allowed to look because they had a, a closer viewing tower that people could shout from, which caused some diplomatic problems, so they shut that. This one but really it's just to remind you that everything we're talking about now, about Cuba's current strategic changes, has to be understood in the context of the impact of US hostility. And we've heard already today in terms of the, uh, from Esther, about the tightening of the embargo legislation, about the arrests of terrorists who are still trying to plant bombs in Cuba, of the attempts to subvert Cuban society by mobilizing so-called civil society. Perhaps it's a bit too loud.
I noticed that Esther, by the way, while we're doing this, has got the Fidelista hat on. Fidel, if you've ever seen Fidel speech, he does this. He plays with the microphone, so Esther says, well, I won't touch it again. <laughs> you're, you're my reference point. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, that uh, the US has been funding fake social networking sites and so on and so forth. So in everything we talk about, uh, with supporters of Cuba, people want to know about Cuba, we should never forget to, rem to remind people all of this does not take place in some kind of experimental vacuum where Cubans can do just whatever they like with their society. Okay, so I'm going to be looking uh, and I'm going to try and concentrate in particular on the impact on uh, workers as workers in Cuba. Cuba is constitutionally a socialist state of workers, and not a state of socialist workers, because that would be too big a presumption to put in a national constitution, but it sets out the objectives. As has already been pointed out, with increasing transfer of economic activity and workers into the, what Cubans call the non-state sector, uh, with increased market uh, forces work in terms of pricing, pricing food and other commodities, it comes not so much as a shock, but it's a bit of, a bit of, it made me wonder what was going on here when I found what was obviously formerly a little state car park in Bayama, uh, where it had been, it was now being rented by a cooperative, so they put up on the, painted on the wall, they were now renting, and underneath it simply said supply and demand. And I thought, what does this mean in a car park? You know, the best thing to do, obviously, is to park around the corner, go in and see how many spaces there are, and then negotiate a price. What else could possibly be happening? But because the lingo is catching on, this little car park have got supply and demand. So the marketization, uh, the increased range of models of economic management, the increased range of uh, employment relationships with people now entitled to have more than one job, part-time work here, part-time work there, full-time, permanent post here, and part-time post there, and so on, and all these different sectors now that they can be working in inside and outside the state sector and the uh, mixed, mixed sector with foreign. And so a lot of those words which we've come to associate with structural readjustment uh, in the neoliberal style are being applied uh, to Cuba. Um, and this reached, I suppose, its, uh, its zenith, or its nadir, whichever you, where you look at it, when the Financial Times editorialised that Raul Castro was more Thatcherite than Thatcher. So I'm going to try and address some of those uh, concerns here, because I think, as we've discussed this morning, this is something we've got to take on. Because if you go to Cuba, then all around you, there's this thing point. Uh, you see signs of this new non-state sector. So, for example, this is Santiago. That's a row of shops, a manicure shop, uh, then a restaurant, a private restaurant, another private restaurant. You can't actually read these, but I know what they are. Uh, a photographic processor and shop. And the last one there, one of the increasingly popular little bucket shops that are springing up, mobile phone repairs and unlocking. I guess a lot of Cubans get their mobile phones off of visitors and then have to have them unlocked for the Cuban. So, which is getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, at the top, one of the uh, reforms that came in the, the big uh, party congress document, inserted by the public debate, by the way, was the right to buy and sell cars and houses. Both have been implemented. So, oops, sorry. There's a lot more of these old bangers that appear on the streets because you can buy one off someone who's not using it. You can rent one off someone who's not using it. You can get a license and be a taxi driver. So there's a like the start of the models on that particular scale in Havana. On the Prado, which some of you will know in Havana by the Sevilla Hotel, and that lovely pedestrian walkway, uh, the promenade, there, there's, a, there's a housing market, these people are selling, showing, this is an estate agent's window, without the window of the estate agent. Um, and a lot of this is being fueled uh, in ways which in the short term, at any rate, are uh, exacerbating some of the wealth inequalities in Cuba that came with the liberalizations in the special period 
uh, of the 90s, but we're still in the special training position. This is, this is Santiago de Cuba Airport, where I was waiting for a flight, uh, and I saw this massive crowd, and I went up to someone and said, what's going on here? And they said, oh, it's the Miami flight coming in. So these are Cubans waiting for relatives and friends from Miami who are bringing money. I mean, some of them just coming to see the families, but a lot of them are there uh, are bringing in goods, bringing in money for house improvements, the opening of the little restaurants, paying for the signs over the shops, paying for the rental of the car, whatever it is. So, and the striking thing about this, which is of course uh, pertinent to the social effects of the crisis, is that Santiago, in terms of ethnicity, is the blackest big city in Cuba, being in the Far East, almost the furthest big city. Uh, but most of the people waiting here were not black. Uh, so, to those that already have, uh, more is accumulating. This is intended, this is understood by Cuban as a short-term price of the measures which they're going to float the whole economy up and say home. So all of those things are significant, but I think the things we have to recall is that, as Esther made clear, she used the expression, Cuba is insisting that this strategy is about building a sustainable uh, and prosperous socialism, and not one whose political economy has produced that bouncing on the bottom uh, in terms of investment and in terms of real incomes. That, uh, Emily demonstrated uh, that it's a, this is a strategy to maintain, as there have been, uh, the very high levels of welfare expenditure. Uh, and I'll show you a chart of that later, showing the comparative terms. To raise living standards uh, and to restore what they call the socialist principle of distribution. In other words, again, the mention has been made of this that in a socialist society, people's wealth and income should be related to the contribution they make anyway, during their working. Because one of the problem that, problems that Cuba is paying most attention to at the moment is the proportion of its population that is in its working years is falling. Because Cuba has first world longevity, more and more people who've retired to look after, and first world fertility, the expression is let's use technically in other words, a low birth rate, because you know, it's an advanced and educated society without much money and people don't want loads of they can avoid it, and they can easily avoid it in Cuba. Um, so, we need to remind people that these changes have taken place as a result of years, actually, of open and public discussion about strategic objectives, uh, and we can demonstrate that in all sorts of ways. If people think socialism is being abandoned, then you have to ask them, why have they reintroduced five-year planning? And why are they strengthening the efficiency of their ministries? Uh, they're not planning to change the political system, they make that very clear. They're not going to change the socialist constitution or the role of the party in the system. Uh, and that certainly won't happen as long as the, uh, Cuba's sovereignty and its constitution is threatened by the United States. And we should never uh, hesitate to remind people that Cuba's constitution, which includes its one party system, whether people like it or not, was. Uh, instituted after a 98% yes vote in a referendum on that constitution with a 98% turnout. Now if anyone, I challenge students <laughs> to find me a constitution that has greater popular legitimacy than that ever, anywhere, in the whole history of the universe. And so far no one's found it. 98% of people voted, and 98% of those who voted voted for the constitution the 2% who didn't vote. Uh, well, I don't know why they didn't vote. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, they were, maybe they were up the pub. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, there's no intent to abandon any of that. The other thing I would say, and this was referred to again this morning, is that we often have, I think all of us have, our own little visions of socialism, uh, which we wish we were living in. Um, of various kinds, and I think people often have a vision of Cuba which dates from the glorious years when uh, guys with long hair and beards defeated a dictatorship and everything opened up and it was like a big carnival for several years. And it's not like that now, uh, but we wish it was. And I think what we should acknowledge is that Cubans are entitled to their own model and to change their own model. 
And actually, if you think historically, uh, no one, in, certainly in the Marxist tradition, thinks that the transitional stage to socialism is one in which there's total state ownership and control of the economy. That happened for particular reasons in Cuba. The nationalization of all small businesses had as much to do with fears of sabotage from the United States as anything else. And that the fact that the Cubans, after two decades or more of uh, crisis, are now reverting to something more like a conventional socialist model of transition, in which the state owns, and con owns almost everything, but controls and regulates everything, but doesn't try to run every little uh, corner shop, every little ice cream seller, every little shoe shine, or whatever. Cuba's now going back to that uh, starting point, if you like, but it isn't a starting point because they've got so much in the meantime. So we should defend Cuba's right to its mix in the economy on the basis of the general strategy and where they're trying to go. And finally, we should, like the Cubans, acknowledge the scale of the changes, acknowledge the problems, as Esther always does, and try to explain them. Now let me rush on a bit. Something that was uh, brought, uh, given legal potential at the end of 2012 for the first time in Cuba was the creation of non-agricultural cooperatives. Cuba's had agricultural cooperatives almost since the start of the revolution. The strategic attitude to them has tended to be, we're talking about peasants here, they're likely to be more collectivist in their thinking if they're in co-ops. It's progressive. It's progressive in the capitalist world for people to be in co-ops, but it won't change capitalism. Uh, Little Ireland of utopianism is the traditional view. In the agricultural sector, as it turns out, the cooperatives in Cuba, which control about 27% of the land, produce 70% of the food, have been quite successful, although the, the 1990s co-ops have been less successful. So it wasn't a completely mad move. And the uh, the guidelines, the guidelines that came out of the Congress, privilege the cooperative system of management uh, of economic units over other non-state forms. Um, so cooperatives now can be formed by workers, uh, professional or manual workers, saying we would like to be a co-op actually, this is what we want to do, we're putting forward a proposal, this is the service or the product, but most of them are actually being formed uh, by the voluntary agreement of groups of workers whose state enterprises are being offered to them. Like that car park uh, up here, some of you may recognize this is not far from the, from the back of the block here, up here is the Coppella Ice Cream Parlour, built on 21 uh, and J, I think it is. So it's very close to the centre of Vidada, very famous fruit and veg place. You can't quite see it there, but uh, the cops is renting that premises from the state. This, some people will be nostalgic to see this is a stretch larder. <laughs> the reason I put it there is that the yellow taxes in Cuba are now a cooperative. They're renting or buying the cars, paying the licenses and renting and buying the cars. This is a Moser workshop, quite a big one, one of half a dozen in Cuba that would become workers' cooperatives. Uh, these, so far, have been mainly in restaurants and uh, food suppliers, sandwich shops, in transport, especially taxi, in other personal services like hairdressing and so on. But also increasingly in professional services, in, uh, in workshops like these, repair workshops, and even like industry in the textile sector. Um, the scale, well, let's just talk about the remit. Part of the privileging comes in the form of lower uh, tax rates, easier access to bank loans, uh, be privileged in the foreign investment uh, links, it's just said. Um, and uh, they are able now, uh, Cuban cops, as are all the self employed, to operate wherever they like in the country. They used to be contained to a municipality, now they can go outside into other regions, the whole country. They can do contracts with other, other private sector or cooperative uh, unions or with the state sector. They can sell into the tourist industry. These, this particular uh, motor repair workshop has uh, contracts with Simex, the massive Cuba commercial and trade conglomerate for its vehicles, and, and some other big names too. Maybe they've just kept those contracts, but the fact is that they've got them. 
that the state sector and the non-state sector are now open for inter-contracting. That's very important. And even in terms of products, the specialist at the University of Hanover was telling me that the workers took over a factory that made women's clothing, for example, uh, the government would encourage them to make men's clothing as well, and children's clothing, if they wanted to, they could get a market for it. Uh, so the remits being, they've been given much more liberty. One of the problems they think they had with the new agricultural co-ops in the uh, 90s was that the state was far too, uh, they called them dysfunctional quasi-state companies, because they were too constrained about what they could make and where they could sell it. Uh, and that is all now being taken away, um, although obviously the state is still regulating in general. So the scale of it so far is not massive. Um, as of uh, last month, uh, there have been nearly 500 non-agricultural co-ops uh, approved, of which about 250 are already working. Uh, in the scale in terms of the labour force is still quite small. With the, colleague at the university there uh, said, you know, I can't actually give you a figure, and honestly say that's the figure. But we are all, you know, the conventional wisdom amongst the experts is it's now about 15,000. But when you put that alongside the 466,000 that are now working in the non-state sector, outside of the agricultural cooperatives, that's another half a million who are outside the stock state sector. It's not very big yet, but it may grow. The advantage is that the Cubans see in this is, first of all, it's, it gives people self-management. Uh, one of the advocates of this uh, in the Cuban academic and political world, Camila Camila Hanika, uh, has said, actually, this is the only thing in the entire party guidelines strategy which is explicitly aimed at increasing self-management. She's an advocate of democratic control from below. Um, so it has that advantage, and maybe there'll be some spillover into other sectors when people get it going. People expect to get better income and to deliver better services, and that seems to be the experience so far. Um, it allows the state to focus on the fundamental means of production, which is its obligation in the Constitution. Uh, and it is also seen as a way, if cooperatives grow and cooperativism grows as a philosophy of economic activity, it will help mitigate against the accumulation privately of capital in the private sector, which the, uh, which the uh, policy says will not be allowed to happen. But obviously, there are, there's always going to be difficulties with how you actually measure it, control it, as we know. Uh, the movement of private capital is not easy to track. So, that's another possibility. Crucially, uh, the Cubans have listened to their uh, friends in the cooperative movement in Latin America in particular in terms of the risk that co-ops just become a group of uh, members of the co-op who then hire labour privately uh, because one of the categories of self-employment that has become uh, possible since 2010, I'll come back to this, is the contracted worker, in other words a private employee. And there's nothing there, there's nothing uh, in the laws of lots of countries to start to stop a cooperative of an example was given to me, a Cuban example actually, of a car repair work uh, co-op that had ten members that employed fifteen mechanics to go out and do all the breakdown work. Now the law does not permit that. The law uh, states that in order to prevent the members of a conceived of in Cuba as a cooperative of workers, not of owners, the members of the co-op cannot employ someone else to do work for more than 30 days. Sorry, 90 days, three months, 90 days. After 90 days, I have to be offered membership or released. Now, you can imagine all sorts of ways around that, especially if you're you know, used to industrial relations. Uh, nevertheless, the law is there. The law is there, and it's the ministry's job to enforce it. Secondly, co-ops are not permitted over the course of a year, calendar year actually, to have more than 10% of their working time uh, undertaken by hired labourers. So, and this of course for Cubans, this, their constitution forbids the exploitation of man by man. 
And the concept of privately employed labour is a challenge, uh, which they're having to confront in various ways. Again, I'll come back to it. So let me move on. So that's the co-op. Uh, new and developing. Uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of optimism being invested in cooperativism, although they're not. They are, they are very, you know, they know that some people could work in a co-op uh, for the whole of the working lives and never become very cooperative. We all work with people like that. Uh, whereas other people will absorb the philosophy and love it, and, you know, link to the community and so on. So they're, they're very realistic, but they're training people, they're running television programs, they're training journalists to write about it, trade unionists to recruit in there and so on. Okay, this is a bit of a clutch, this slide, I'm afraid. Um, but it's not that much fun. State sector salaries, we know, uh, are in some ways the biggest threat to revolution. Trade union officials will say to you, if we cannot get salaries back to a level where they allow people to live a decent life, this revolution can't survive. Because we've been, you know, we've been scratching around for too long. We can't go on indefinitely. To find ways of raising productivity and production in this economy, getting investment in, and paying people salaries that they can live on, that don't have to turn to fiddle work and black market work and so on. This is an open discussion, open from the very top down, as Raoul's famous speech in 2007 when he acknowledged the inadequacy of the salaries. This is not external criticism, this is a lively internal debate which you can read if you read Spanish in their newspapers online. Salaries are inadequate, and salaries are falling in real terms because of rising world prices and because of the increased use of supply and demand pricing as well. So a concept that's become very lively in Cuban debate now is salario real, the real salary. In other words, the inflation adjusted salary is now an issue in public policy debate, trade union debate. Uh, it was when the, T, when the CTC, the TUC, conducted a national debate on the reform labour code proposals, the biggest single item that was brought up was salaries. The salaries aren't regulated by the labour code, but this was an opportunity to have a belly in. And there were other serious issues as well brought up. And the CTC's report to its 20th Congress in February contains a very powerful statement about the inadequacy of salaries. So you know, this is a central problem that's being addressed in these in these changes. They want they're trying, to, they're trying to use performance-related pay. The problem is if you haven't got the orders or you haven't got the materials, you haven't got the investment funds, you can't necessarily raise, even by shaking out labour, which I'll talk about, you can't necessarily raise uh, productivity in ways that enables management to justify bonus payments or performance-related pay. Another problem they've had, which they've just addressed by changing the law, is that where these things have been working, the management have been quitting their management jobs and going on the shop floor because their bonuses were capped at thirty percent of their salary, whereas on the shop floor now production workers have an unlimited potential to increase off their basic low level salary line through productivity uh, improvement. One of the uh, mechanisms that Raul Castro has said is actually said that tax will become the main redistributive uh, mechanism. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration given that salaries are much more significant than the, the state sex, sal sex salaries in discussing with the trade unions, but it's the council of state which legally changes the salary scale. Whatever kind of schemes are operating locally, the actual scale is set by that. Um, and we've now got 466,000 self-employed people paying taxes. And this move to open up self-employment According to the CTC statistics, includes amongst that 466,000, 69% of them, if you can work out what that is, were previously uh, not registered either in education or the workforce. So this move single handedly has brought something like 350,000 black market workers into legality and tax payment and contributing social insurance. And that's a massive plus. Not to say it's a massive plus in terms of their the security and tranquility of their lives as well. That's a break. Massive question. Yeah. Big massive question. Pardon? 
it okay to ask a question? As you right now, on? yes, if you want. Well, is it? Uh, <laughs> let me finish. Just right, a definition. What oh. the definition of self-employment. Right, the definition of self-employment is, I should have said, is in Cuba is someone who's taken out a license under one of the 200 plus categories that are permitted for self-employment. So it's anyone who's, who's, who's working for themselves or working for someone else if their license is to be a hired labourer um, in any of those 200 categories. So I'll say a little bit more about what this means, what this means in terms of uh, informalisation. Okay, big increases have come. There's the actual newspaper article uh, to uh, medical salaries, well, health worker salaries in general, more, at least double, sometimes almost treble. This is the government says this is the first. And that's justified in terms of the fact that through the uh, labour shakeout, the health sector saved something like 2 million pesos a year. Reduced its workforce by 169,000 um, by identifying uh, unnecessary pubs. Uh and that's allowed. And that plus the income of the, from the export earnings of Cuban medical services has been used to justify massive increases in the basic salaries of Cuban medics, and also increases in the salaries of those who are working abroad and paid in our currency. The uh, Venezuelan. Cuban medics have got parity with the Brazilian Cuban medics. Brazil was paying more, so the Venezuelans are now having to pay more. Uh, they didn't wait for industrial disputes to break out, they just coughed up. Um, okay, in the short term, is that a wine box? In the short term, these problems of some people having access to hard currency goods, a fan and a washing machine, they're probably two years average salary. These things will probably get worse in some areas in the short term. The labour restructuring has produced a lot of uncertainty. Uh, people were kept in work because there's a right to work in the constitution, whether or not they have that much to do throughout the special period. But you can't build growth on the basis of that kind of uh, political economy. So, as of 2010, work studies were done. It was a very, uh, it was a process that was protected by worker control on paper, not always in practice, but on paper, it, the Workers' Assembly had to approve the new total number of posts. A committee dominated by elected workers was to recommend who should be in those posts. That didn't happen in some places to start with, and it was rushed, and it wasn't done properly. And the CTC stopped the process completely and said, we've got to stop this and go back and look at this. And the government accepted that. But it is happening. And there is this target to get one third of the workforce in the non-state sector by the end of the five-year plan, end of 2016. Um, it's not in formalisation because every Cuban, as a citizen, is entitled to free health and education and, another, and some other things. Every Cuban self-employed worker, as long as they're not illegal, is entitled to welfare benefits, unemployment, accident, maternity, etc., etc. So there's no, there's no way in which this is creating the kind of excluded, super-exploited, uh, benefit-less, pension-less, uh, 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 self-employed sector you see in most of Latin America. That needs to be stressed. The unions have a big task to defend workers in this decentralised economy, but also to recruit uh, the workers in the private sector in inverted commas, and literally, and this is the terminology they use, keep them on the side of the revolution. They do recognise the risk of uh, a small business sector emerging, which is anti-socialist in its ideology, and they're trying to deal with that directly. Big challenge, they've got about 80% of the self-employed union membership that have played a big part in the Congress and the discussions about the Labour Okay, a couple more substantial points to make. Uh, one is about the new labour code. It's not quite been published. There was the massive round of consultation as usual. Uh, we won't know until it's finally published what impact that had because no one will show you the revised uh, version, even though it's been around for nearly six months because it's in the hands of the parliamentary redrafting commission because there were one or two new points inserted at the very last minute 
including adding sexual orientation to the list of things you can't be discriminated against. Uh, that's out all of these standard rights. Uh, the thing I want, two things I want to just emphasize here. Uh, firstly, after a long debate and a very intensive debate, which started off with the Ministry of Labour saying self employed workers who are hired labour, contracted labour, private employees, will not be recognised in the law as workers. They will be recognised as civil contractors. Now, anyone who's done trade union work anywhere around the public sector will be familiar with this peripheral workforce that don't have proper contracts and are regarded as, self, as civil contractors. Uh, this was fought by labour lawyers, by some of the trade unions, a real battle that went on. Finally, the Supreme Court's labour bench ruled that anyone in a position of subordination to an employer is a worker. Every worker in Cuba in that position is a worker. So when this picture was taken for a BBC documentary, these guys turned up to work for farm. They did not have the protection of labour. They will have it under the new labour code. That's a massively important uh, victory for the trade unions and the labour laws, I think, personally. And the other thing I wanted to point out was that um, as a consequence of, and again, this is about the tensions of rapidity and trying to get there. Again, the Ministry have proposed a new level in the grievance procedure. In the state sector, there are elected, they're called organs of basic law, uh, labour justice. Those are grievance and disciplinary panels whose personnel are elected workers from the workplace. Thereafter, you go into the court system if you're not satisfied. The proposal in the, in the draft Labour Code was that there, if management weren't satisfied with the outcome of the basic organ's decision, they could appeal to a higher level of management and they would have a final say before the court. That was not popular in the trade union movement and that's gone. So, the rights are being built in there. There are new rights, 19 new rights. So there were, Everything that's always been there in terms of collective bargaining rights. Every workplace by law must have collective bargain. It must be negotiated with the unions and it must be voted in by a majority of the workforce in a workers' assembly with a 70% turnover. That's about as good as it gets. Okay, final substantial point foreign investment law. I won't talk about it. We've talked a little bit about the purposes of it. Uh, let me just talk about the um, They've got the in there, so it's uh, crazy. Uh, let me just talk about the employment consequences. Cubans will not be directly employed by foreign capitalists. There is provision for exceptional circumstances, but that's not specified, and it's not intended that that will ever happen, according to the presentation to the National Assembly. As you may be aware, there's been a lot of criticism from uh, from businesses in the states, from the politicians, from opponents of Cuba saying the people who work in the foreign sector, uh, the Cuban labor exchange hires them to the employer who pays, let's say for example, $100 a month. But the Cubans only give the workers 100 pesos on a 1 to 24 exchange. So that's exploitation. Even George W. Bush, actually spoke publicly in favour of workers receiving the full value of the labour they produced. In other words, he, he reverted, he not only went back to labour theory of value, he went beyond Marx to the crude versions that Marx demolished. Uh, but suddenly, American businessmen were concerned about workers who didn't get paid a decent proportion of the value of their product. The more substantial point for employers was they couldn't incentivise these workers because of the, the limitations of the salary. In the new system, under the new foreign investment law, uh, they're saying, we're not doing this for short-term gain, but for long-term development. So we'll still sell you the labor through a Cuban labor exchange. All our workers will be subject to Cuban labor law, Cuban social security law, and you foreign capitalists will pay the social security contributions as employers. You will do that. But the workers will get 80% of what you pay. So they're almost reversing the proportion. So this isn't any more about us grabbing cash in the short term. So that's that's a breakthrough. Um, 
And finally, I just wanted to conclude by saying in this, what Ralph Castro has called Journey into the Unknown, these changes are very extensive. They do, in, they do involve a big reduction in the direct state management of the economy, much less paternalistic, as they put it, labour market, more, more uncertainty for workers, workers having to take more responsibility for their working life. Um, but this is Cuba, so we're talking about decisions made by mass participation in debate, we're talking about change coming through consensus, we're talking about a social wage that's protected, and this is my piece of social wage skyscraper chart. This is a UN, uh, a UN graph from uh, the Economic Commission of Latin America and the Caribbean showing the proportion of GDP of Latin America and the Caribbean countries that goes on social spending, not state spending in general, but social spending, from 1991 to 2000. <laughs> There's the skyscraper. At every point, including the very depths of the crisis, Cuba has always devoted more of its national wealth to the social welfare of its <coughs> Always. And it's also almost free cash flow as well. So that's what they're protecting. This is, uh, you know, this is why we have a victory, so we can have standards. <coughs> so that's very important. Workers' rights are being protected. They are being changed. There's more flexibility. But the rights are there. Some are being strengthened, so new ones are coming in. And that's true also of union rights. And the whole purpose is to raise incomes, protect the conquistas, the conquest of the revolution in social terms, and it's not about uh, private profit being tolerated. So sustainable and prosperous socialism. They have got a lot of new allies and trading partners, but for goodness sake, they could do so much more if we get the bloody embargo off their back. So our solidarity work in this aspect, perhaps more political, as it has been for some time, uh, is more important than ever because the Cubans are desperately now trying to grow their way out of the, the post Soviet crisis at long last. And they, they still need our support and understanding, and we have to keep providing that understanding. And now, also increasingly, in ways that convinces other people on the centre left that Cuba's not in transition to capitalism. Cuba is changing its route. Uh, to socialism and beyond. Thank you.